And uh, <laughs> not for that. <laughs> but you know what I missed? I think out of most everything is I missed the sound. I was ministering at a conference. Uh, Tracy Stewart was there. Some of you know Tracy. She's been here a number of times. And so I met her husband, and we were at dinner because we were both speaking, and she said, what is it that you call that when you walk into your church? And I said, the door? (laughs) (laughs) So I'm trying to figure out, and she's trying to explain it to her husband, and uh, I mean, I wasn't sounding as spiritual as she was, and she travels, she travels a lot, probably a lot more than I do, a lot more than I do. And she said, I've never heard it anywhere else. And I said, what is it you're hearing? And then she she said, you told me one time. And I I said, oh, it's the pre-awe of God. And she said, that's the word. So wherever I'm going, I pray when I walk in that I will have the pre-awe of God. Because there's a sense that you can walk into a place and there's a buzz in the room there's a sound, people are, they may be visiting with one another, but there's a sense of expectancy while they're visiting with one another that today could be the day. The Lord's ready to do something, and something good is about to take place. And so I just want to encourage you that uh, you do make a sound, <clears throat> whether you believe it or not, and sometimes it's in the beginning, but, but there's something happening with that. Uh, and I miss that, where... We worship the Lord and there's just this sound, the sound of many waters, the way the Bible describes it. And I want to just jump in. Uh, Today I'm going to be shorter and the reason is uh, because I've been trying for a good while to do that. And so I thought if I would tell you ahead of time, I would be more committed to it. And some of you think, yeah, right. I grew up where you could speak for over an hour and that's just what you did and... uh, I understand we're in a time where people's attention span is, is maybe shorter, but maybe you hear more and absorb more. And so uh, I have plenty of other time to, I, I won't give you everything that, that's in my heart. But just to let you know that um, I just uh, dropped Diane off. I didn't drop her off, dropped her off at home. But she and I have been in the emergency room with her since 5 o'clock this morning. As she's passing blood, I mean, it was pretty bad and I just all I could do is walk around praying in the spirit her bed doctors and nurses come in and what are you you kind of you know what are you doing and and so anyway uh, came back after a lot of testing just a real bad so the best thing we can find it's a bad kidney infection she said I've never had those but I I was walking around and the the Lord gave me the scripture many are the affliction of the righteous but the Lord delivers them all and so she and I have been in a, in a battle, you know, off and on for a good while with this. And she knows this. And she knows that we, we break through. And sometimes the path takes us having to go through one way or the other. But in the end result is. So she's resting this morning. <clears throat> but I, here's the reason I said that to you. Because she was watching the clock. And uh, she said, you have time to make it so you can preach. And I said, well, Frankie can cover. He knows he's got one always in the oven working on time. So I know he can cover that. And she said, no, I want you to go, even if you have to leave me here. And I said, I don't know. Anyway, I was glad when they came in and uh, we can move on from that point. So turn with me this morning to to Isaiah 26 and verse 3. And uh, I want to give you a little bit of a story that I will not... I will do, cut it short in righteousness that, pr- that will prompt uh, where I'm heading so it will it'll give you a little bit of a, an understanding. A few, few weeks ago I was heading to the airport probably tired for whatever reason catching an early flight and I had the thought that just came to me and it was and I was fighting traffic going to DFW every which way and I had the thought is, I don't know why people would even invite me to come to their church and minister. And just stood there for a little bit. And I, I gave it a sense and I thought, yeah, that's true. Why would they? And I can tell you what I observed from that moment on affected me. It got my attention. 
I've, I've made that trip to DFW airport. I don't know how many times my truck can do it on autopilot. Half the time, I don't even look. <clears throat> if you believe that, then you'll be happy with the rest of it. And so I got close to the exit, and the traffic just seemed to come up around me and wouldn't let me over. I was binding every demon I could think of that operates in Dallas, period, anyway, and wouldn't let me over. I had to fight to get over there. And then when I got to the place where I parked and the shuttle guy, he was cranky. He wouldn't help me with the bags. He just got on there and it just seemed like I was invisible to him. And I thought, then God, you're not on this. Your grace is off of this. And because the Holy Spirit always reminds me, remember you've always said, when something's easy, it doesn't necessarily mean it's God. And we always say when something's easy, it must be God, and when it's tough, it's the devil. So we blame things on either or that's not even true. So I got to the, the airport, went to the ticket agent. They know me by lots of reasons. My driver's license should pull up. You're pre-checked. You're this and that. You go in. And so all of a sudden, I felt like I was an orphan. She wouldn't make eye contact with me, looked away, would not answer my questions. And I was just, Ugh. And I just felt more defeated. So went up to TSA, had the pre-check, had all the things. If you fly, you know what that is. Walk right on there, walk on through. That day, the, 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 the guy that was doing the screening pulls me out of line and starts frisking me. <laughs> Insult to injury. Now one thing to the other. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares. Nobody wants you. Nobody, nobody cares who you are. And I went, finally got to the gate, and I thought, I hope the pilot isn't in a bad mood when I get on the plane. <laughs> but here's what I observed. Because I had believed a lie, it attracted all of the other lies. It's because there's an attraction that happens when you give out an uncertain sound, that's what 1 Corinthians 14, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, how will they know to respond or whatever it is? And yet it's very much possible that we're giving out sounds that attracts the hordes of hell and attracts other demonic things. And then we wonder, where, where God are you? Well, God hasn't changed. Where are you? Did you move away from where who he is and what he is? And so I was sitting there, got on the plane and re recounting all the way back there. And I heard the Holy Spirit said, you brought all this on you. Because you believe something that I didn't say. And then you start saying it back to yourself. And the more you said it back to yourself, the more attractive it was to all of the other demonic spirits. Hath God said? Does God really know where you are? Is this all happening? I feel alone in this. And all these other kind of things that if you believe the first lie, you can start moving down that rabbit hole. If you went into, uh, you could go into Ezekiel and talks about the king of Tyre. And the king of Tyre was known for his trading. Tyre was a city, was very much commerce. But it talks about the king of Tyre, which speaks of the principality, actually. There was a real king, but also the principality and spirit over that. And I think I've even preached for that about believing a lie. And what the king of Tyre traded in, he was known for his much trading, the Bible said. He traded in lies. The Bible says, buy the truth and not sell it. If any time you give away a truth, then you receive a lie. Because you can't have them both at the same time. If you give the truth away, then you bought into the lie. If you give the lie away, then you, you have the truth. So the two don't come, come together. So when you start believing a lie, hath God said, maybe I'm wrong, maybe this didn't happen, maybe this is, you know, maybe I believed something a long time ago, and you buy into that lie, now you have attracted a whole other culture around you. A culture of unbelief, a culture of doubt, a culture of fear, a culture of, of uh, disbelief. Remember, Jesus was always dealing with the disciples. Oh, you of little faith. He didn't say you were unfaithful. He didn't say they had no faith, but you had little faith because I've given you plenty of things to build your faith around. So with that in mind, I want us to look at something. In Psalms, uh, Isaiah 26 and 3, I was sharing this on a Zoom call with some pastors uh, recently, and then I want to go into this idea. Um, it's not a theory, it's a reality, and that is frequency and sound is all the way through Scripture. 
You're always nervous uh, several years ago about bringing anything up like this because people thought you were a new age and whatever. So what happens is that new age steals something that's God and we give it up. God says, here's a rainbow. And we say, oh, we can't have that anymore. We've got to get rid of that because that speaks of something else. And because we trade a lie, trade the truth off for a lie, and now we stay away from that. Yet God wants to redeem his truth, what he said in the beginning, because everything originally that he said is for redemption purposes. Yeah. The tree of life didn't go away. There is a tree of life. He's in heaven, and he is the tree of life. I mean, not just a something out of the ground, but he represents the tree of life. All right. Uh, Isaiah 26 and verse 3. <clears throat> and he said, In that day the song will be sung in the land of Judah. They were talking about this salvation, deliverance, restoration back in, into the land in Jerusalem. So the song will be sung in the land of Judah, or the place of praise. We have a strong city. This is what they're saying. God will appoint salvation or deliverance for walls and bulwarks. So you are surrounded with you around salvation. You're more important than what you know. You're more victorious than what you know. You just have to buy into the truth. The truth makes you free. Now sometimes the truth is not just information. All the time the truth is not information. It's a person called the Holy Spirit. But when you believe into something factual and that becomes your truth base and you believe in that, you become free to believe another lie. And on it goes, on it goes, on it goes. From the point is that, that you, can, you carry an orphan spirit. All right. Look at verse, uh, verse 3 is where I want to get to. You, God, will keep him, meaning you and I, in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I think it's interesting to note that when looking through this scripture, he uses perfect and peace in the same context. And in the Hebrew, the original language, perfect and peace are the exact same word. There is not a Hebrew word for peace and then another Hebrew word for peace. It is shalom, perfect is shalom. And also we know peace is shalom. So I said, I will keep him, his mind stayed in the shalom, shalom. Look somebody next to you and, and just say to them, shalom, shalom. You have just declared perfect peace over them. So when he's called us to be is that we walk in the shalom, shalom of God, that when you're declaring the shalom, shalom of God in your home and family, you're invoking the very name of God that says you have bulwarks, you have salvation, your gates are praised, you're now protected because you're declaring the shalom, shalom of God. But we tend to want to always share how bad things are and we miss the shalom of God. Now what's interesting is he uses the word... Uh, and he said, whose mind, mind is not just your brain, but it's the word yetzar, which means your imagination or how you frame something. So if you were going to make a picture and you wanted a special, you put a frame around it. Yetzar means what you're looking at is what you're intending on becoming like. How are you framing your life? What are you picturing, if you would? It's just, yetzar is the same word for imagination. We know that imagination, when it's vain, it can, it can lead us in a lot of destructive things. But if you've ever read the book, uh, Power of Right Thinking, I think, yeah, is that, or Power of Thoughts, Power of Right Thinking, um, we, and also Power of Imagination, it is the word teslam, which means vibration or frequency. When God said something, he didn't have a brain, so he wasn't saying like words and vocabulary. It would literally, there's this vibration, teslam, that came out of the presence of God, his frequency, and then the Holy Spirit, part of the frequency of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is now brooding over the face of the deep. And he's letting his sound, his nature, inseminate into chaos and darkness. Now when the Bible says we were created in the image Teslam, the very imagination, Yetzar, of God, that he put Yetzar inside of us and he's saying, can you frame what I am? Can you frame who I am? Can you frame your life after the I am that I am? I was and I am and will be. So when you frame the I am of God, not based upon the lie, like God hasn't given me anything, God hasn't done what I want him to do, but frame him after his nature, not yours. Because if you frame life after what you've come through as a child or wherever you came from, you always tend to look things from that lens or that frame. 
But when you reframe the way God is and what the Bible says about him, you've come into a sound, a vibration, if you will, that where your spirit now is moving at the same understanding, at the same speed, if you will, revelation of who God is. If you went to Psalms uh, 29, this the voice of the Lord, anytime you hear the word voice, is the same word as vibration or sound. The voice of the Lord is upon the face of the waters. And for you and I, we're about 72% water. So he says, I'm vibrating inside of you. There's something resonating inside of you. The devil wants to give you another sound. I want you to give my sound. So if we would understand to have in our homes, families, and marriages, the sound of the Spirit of God, we would literally break the sound of the enemy. The sound of the enemy, hath God said, the sound of God is, yes, I am that I am. Shalom, shalom. That's the sound of God. Now, uh, Proverbs, we know Proverbs 23 says, as one thinks, yet sar imagines, considers, so will he become. You and I are more in charge of the direction we have in our life than what you think we are. We're not just waiting for something to happen, waiting for someone to knock on the door and hand us a check for a million dollars. I mean, the fact is, it'd be great if they did that. And so, but the, what are you framing? If you're framing in your life, nothing good happens to me. I don't know what's going to happen. This could happen. Something else might even happen that's worse. Job said, that which I f feared, yet saw, or imagined, came on me. To push back the gates of hell, we have to start having the mind of Christ, the Yetzar of God, the mind of Christ. And Paul said we can have the mind of Christ. So what are, how we think and the words we're speaking literally gives power to all that we're, that we're believing God for. I was uh, looking at this and I was reading uh, some, some information and it says the Library of Medicine put out this statement to doctors. And said for the, the doctors that spoke well to their patients of hope and gave empathy for who they are, that their bodies and physical symptoms went away much faster than saying as, I don't know, you know, there's some people not do, if you don't do this, boy, you're really in bad shape. I've never seen anybody so bad as you. Well, that doesn't sound like too much empathy. And so as we hear, then we start responding because Words create pictures and pictures can create destiny. And so I want us to look at how we can change what we're picturing in our life, especially in our marriages. You have the marriage that you declare you have. <laughs> I thought some of you men would say, oh me. And the lady said, yes, amen. <laughs> but we tend to hope that they'll read a book somehow or watch a video and all of a sudden their world has changed. But we start from the inside out declaring the end from the very beginning of what we're looking for change. Instead of reporting the problem, if you read the book Power of Blessing, we're declaring what shall be. How am I framing my life? How am, where am I going to be one, three, five years down the line? Because if words have packets of energy, which science tells us, and I wish I had time to get into all that, but there is something that says that it, it, it sets up our future and our days ahead. If God said, and he said, everything he created said, it is good, then how much more should we be saying, it's good. The goodness of God, the love of God, it's, it's who he is. But when he say, that's not good, they're not doing good, and all judging everybody and everything else, we're saying is, I'm in opposition to the will of God. All right. Uh, look with me to Hebrews, the first chapter, and uh, verse 3. Man, I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself. I'm like it's. <clears throat> Thank you. Hebrews, Hebrews one. Um, Genesis eleven at the Tower of Babel, they all spoke one language. We know that verse. And it wasn't the language, probably a known language, but they were speaking some language. And God came down because the the there's a name for me. I always call them Guggenauts, but there's another name for them. That they are created this tower because it became a monument to them. And there were probably the Nephilim and some other things involved in that. But it was totally against what God was doing. It was in opposition. So God comes down. 
I mean, God's not walking. Now, he comes down. His spirit presence of God is there. And he saw what they were doing. The entry note, as he said, there was nothing impossible to them what they had imagined. Even God himself is the power of imagination. Even Einstein said everything he created was 90% imagination and 10% sweat. I don't know what he sweated over, but anyway, he worked hard at it. So we understand that as one thinks in his heart, so they become for that point. I want to give you uh, what Hebrews 1 verse 3, and it, it'll, it'll give you, a, I'm going to get up three keys that every successful breakthrough person, believer, if you'll follow these three things, then you'll have a, your transformed life. I guarantee it. Well, the word guarantees. I don't guarantee anything. Except I'll be done in 20 minutes. <coughs> And that's a soft guarantee, by the way. <laughs> All right. Verse 2. Here it is. It's up there. I'll tell you what. I need to. I got it right here, too, just to make sure I have it. This is uh, King, King, New King James. Who being the brightness, speaking of Jesus, in the last days speaking to us by Jesus, who being the brightness or light of his glory and the express image. Now that word express means he's saying something, it's expressing. Express doesn't mean the fast lane. It means an expression or something comes from the inside out. What are you and I expressing? Expressing how bad things are or are we expressing the very nature of God? Hang on. But express the image of his person and uphold all things, and that's the key word I want to look at, upholding all things by the word of his, how, of his power. To uphold all things is the word echo, E-C-H-O. That's a, I know it's an English word, but it's the Greek word. Echo means to hold everything in place, but it means to resound the sound that came at you. We know what an echo is. In a submarine, or I guess any naval thing, the sonar would send out a signal and when it finds something solid, it sends back a signal and they can tell the distance and where it is of that. That you and I have a sound that God is saying, if you will sound back or say back what I have been saying over your life, then I can uphold you. Upholding is better than holding down. The devil wants to hold you down, God wants to uphold you. It's the idea of having the pillar or the strength, the rebar, if you would, in your life. So when you uphold, the, word, the idea is that if God says you're a son and a daughter, and you're saying, oh, I don't think I'm worth anything, then what happens is, instead of resounding the echo, upholding what he said, then you're resisting what he said. In other words, if we say something that he's not saying, we're not resounding or resending it back. He sent his word and healed them. Matthew 8, the centurion that asked for his uh, servant to be healed, and, uh, and Jesus said, I'll come and heal them. He said, no, it's, you don't need to do that. Just send the word, echo it, sound that word out, because he said, I am, I'm receiving that word right then. What is the Holy Spirit saying over you and I, that could be, whether it's prophetic or out of his word, that he's saying, I want you to just say it back to me. Pray what my word says. What does my word say? Not just believe in it. Resend it. Resound it. Rethink it. Repray it. Redeclare it unto him. Because when we do that, we have a breakthrough and we're sounding off what God has said. It means that we believed it. All right. So the, the idea is that it upholds all things. means to hold something in position and hold it for expansion. In other words, God has said something and it moves on that way. Let me give you an example. When Jesus was coming in Jerusalem and um, the crowd was saying, uh, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And a few uh, religious folks got jealous, the, the, uh, the Pharisees, and said, uh, Jesus, you need to tell them to quit that and calm it down. In other words, they were jealous because they didn't want him to get any praise or recognition. And Jesus says to him, if, says to the religious folk, if they don't praise, then even the rocks will cry out. If you went back and you studied what Hebrews 1, 3 says, he upholds all things. Now, how many know what all things represent? That means you, dirt, everything is upheld by the word of his power is exousia, but it's also dynamis. It's a word that means authority with power or power with authority. So if he's upholding all things by his power and he's waiting for you and I to say it back, 
know we believe it enough, we're saying it back to him, then we are being upheld. We're, that's what the righteous, he upholds the, he upholds the righteous. So when Jesus saying the very rocks, what's held together, the very atoms in the atmosphere have molecular structure and they're held together by a sound. Blessed are the people that what? Know the joyful sound, Psalms 80, 89, 15. So there is a sound within us that when we give it back to him, we destroy the works of the devil. Fear has a sound and it attracts everything of darkness. And whatever spirit we're like, we're attracted. I mean, I attracted everything on the way to the airport. I realized, I, you know, the devil, I took a bait, you know, and with that, it attracted everyone. And these people didn't even realize what they were doing. But I, it was just something spiritually that was resistant towards us. Resist the devil, not agree with the devil. So when we see the, the idea that he upholds all things by the word of his power, that by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the Father. So there is the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us to echo what the Holy Spirit is saying. What, do we, what should we be echoing in our families? What should we be echoing in our, in our marriages? Instead of just telling them, oh, you're just like your mama. You're just like this. Or you're this. You're never. And we're echoing something of another spirit. When we're saying something that God did not say, we're echoing another spirit. When, when we're echoing another spirit, yet we're believing God for something differently, we are in opposition to the very thing God's saying. It's the same word. It says, What's, when, if any two, as touching, will agree, the touching something will agree, it will be done in my Father in heaven. The word touching there is homologeo. Homo meaning together, logeo or logos means saying. Touching, saying the same thing at the same time together. And he uses the word touching, P-E-R-I-P-E-R-I, which means when you touch, you make a circuit. You complete a circuit. So I'm in agreement, we're in agreement, we're in a complete circuit by faith, and something dynamically begins to happen. There is the Spirit of the Holy Ghost inside of you that wants to make a complete circuit, and the Father can hear you from that point. All right. Let me give you three things that um, you can practice. Hebrews 5 and verse 14. You that are a full age, strong meat, belongs to those of full age, he's saying. Who've had your senses, those who by reason of use, have had their senses exercised. We got people in there to exercise. You'd exercise your body, you need to exercise your senses. You have spiritual senses that you have to exercise, knowing the difference between good and evil. So he's telling us that you can develop your heart, you can develop your spiritual uh, wherewithal, intuitiveness, by practicing things of the Spirit of God. And I want to give you what those there's three things are right quick. When you're looking for a change or transformation, something to break through, then here's number one. Three practices to frame your life. If you are framing yet sour, imagining, here's number one. See it. Pastor Frankie and I have both been, have shared out of Jeremiah 111. When God says, what do you see? And Jeremiah says, I see the almond tree. And he said, you've seen well. You described it well. So now I'm ready to perform my word. If what you're seeing is not what God wants to do, you may be, in, you may be devoted away from what God's seeing. If you're seeing through the lens of self-pity, seeing through the, the lens of what somebody did to you 20, 30 years ago, you'll be stuck there and you'll be seeing it and continually, and everything will be judged through what you're seeing. Although what you're seeing is not what God wants to see. So when you see it, spend, here's how to change it. Spend time meditating and envisioning, that's not a bad word, imagination, it's all right, what you're believing for, your family, marriage, your job, your health. What are you believing for? <clears throat> Don't say one thing and then practice something else. I'm believing God for, but nobody else wants to help me. That's, that's you know, counterintuitive, counterproductive. So if you're going to see it, begin to frame it. Write it out. What am I believing God for? And then don't let the devil talk you out of it, even if you are in traffic. <clears throat> All right. Number two, saying it. Proverbs 18.1. 
The power of life and death is in the tongue. We know that. And out of the abundance of the heart, what we've been filling our heart, meditating on, believing God for, and it's framed into that. So if something else comes into the picture that doesn't fit into that frame, it's out of bounds. It is trespassing. Do not let the enemy trespass what you have framed out for your family and your lives. My children will be taught of the Lord. The devil comes in and tries to show you, I'm going to take your kids. Nope, that doesn't fit into the frame. You're out of bounds. Get out of here. You're trespassing. This is holy ground because being born of the spirit is the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. This carnality of the enemy trying to defeat you, it will be broken. All right, number two. Saying it. You see it. Got my S's down. Now saying it. Proverbs 18.1, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Out of the abundance, the heart gives a rudder for the direction. And I just shared with you about what the doctors, the medical science said with that. And as you begin to say it, believe in God for it, you'll see a transformation. Here's the third and last one. Strengthen it. If I'm seeing it and then I'm saying it, there's times that I have to come back along and water it or strengthen it. Because if the strength in that is a pillar, is which is the echo, I have to strengthen that and say back to that thing that me and my house will be saved. All of my family will know the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm talking to Sylvester. trying to get in. My body is the temple of the living God. What are you saying over yourself? Believing one thing and then saying another, another thing. That's schizophrenic. The Bible says it is a, a double-minded man. If you went into James, you would say... A double-minded man is like one who's like a sea, that waves of the sea. And if you've ever been looked at an oscill oscillator, oscill oscillator, oscillator, thank you, because Lisa, Lisa, grew up, Lisa grew up in there. An oscillator had wavelengths like this. A double-minded person is one. Yeah. When God says something, is your, it's a laser. It will not return void, but it will penetrate and hit the mark where it is. If some of us, well, I know God can, but maybe sometimes he doesn't. And there's ways that we can always, you know, believe God for it. And so we just trust in the Lord. And I mean, we're just like a lazy river, just up and down, up and down. Double-minded man, he said, will in no way be able to receive anything. It's possible the reason we don't see answers is because we're on another wavelength than God. <clears throat> we're just on a different frequency when Jesus after resurrection shows up and they had, the disciples had the door locked because they thought they were next on the hit list of the Romans all of a sudden Jesus shows up inside the room whoa we haven't seen that before because literally everything that has, has is an atom has energy to have energy, it is an atom. The, the very rocks have energy inside, whether you believe it or not. It's the way it is. And so with that, Jesus became saying, feeling, experiencing the same thing as with whatever was going on in, in creation. And he just steps into that. Well, you think, I think you're new agey. Well, I think I'm more, I think you just need to move up to the level of faith because the Bible says it. As one thinks, as one who says in his heart, he becomes one with, homo legale. So if you're looking for change, start coming into, start coming into agreement with, with what God has said. Now, here's the last verse. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 12. The Word of God. How many believe the Word of God? Amen. You just believe in it, or do you really believe it? Or are you to believe it when it makes sense, or you believe it even when it doesn't make sense? Amen. And he says, His Word is living alive. That word means it has energy all inside of itself. So when you say this is what the word of God says, then there's an energy in life that begins to come and penetrate. By, by the same token, when we doubt and have unbelief, I don't know about that, then what I'm saying is I'm resisting the life of the spirit. Every successful person that I know of has practiced these three keys. I'm seeing it, saying it, and I'm strengthening everything that I'm believing about it. Is the word is alive, sharper than any two-edged swords, cutting even to the borrow, the, down to the moan, because it will separate soul and spirit. It will separate thinking from the Spirit of God. How many know that us thinking it doesn't transform it? Now, 
One well, last verse and I'm done. Because I have five minutes. Wow. I feel so good. Thank you. <clears throat> I tell you what, there was people betting on the odds that I couldn't do it. I know. You got to pay your 10% tithe off of the bet when you okay. <clears throat> to sanctify it. Now, what was I going to say? All right. In Ephesians 3, that verse where I said, He'll do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think, according to the power that works in you. In other words, that power is you resounding it. He will do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you can ask or think, because what he is saying has moved beyond what you're asking and thinking. So when we only ask based upon what we think he can do, or based upon what we deserve, then we're way low below what he wants to do. And we settle for less than what God intended for us. So in that sense, it's doubt and unbelief. Not in the fact of what, what God can do, because most of us wouldn't doubt that, but we doubt whether he would do it for us or not. We doubt whether he can do it for us. Now here's the bottom line. Then it goes on to say, and to know the height, the depth, the length, and the width to know the love of God. How many realize that's four dimensions? That's the fourth dimension. Most of the time we understand length and width. And we're linear thinkers. And when it doesn't fall in beyond that, because most of the time we can even see depth to a level, but most of us don't see height. Because we're looking down all the time. Looking to see where I'm at. I find in scripture... Where Abraham, God says to Abraham, look from where you look up from where you're standing. And look and see the stars. If you're only staring down at where you're standing, you can never go where he wants to take you. Lift your eyes and believe him for things that's out of this world. Amen. Father, we believe you for supernatural activity today. That your name is above every name that ever could be named and pronounced. That you exceed more than what we thought possible. Help us, O oh God, that our minds are renewed, that we have the mind of Christ, so that we can declare on earth what you've been saying about us all along. You have things to say about us. You have thoughts that are beyond our thoughts. According to Psalms 40, you're, you have thoughts more than what we could even count. So we're believing today, O oh God, that you would transform our thoughts. So our thoughts aren't just laid upon one another, but our thoughts are stayed upon you. And we lift our heads from which comes our help. The glory and the lifter of our heads. We repent today, O oh God, that we've turned left and right and looked at everybody else, measured the world and saw how bad it was. And in, in every moment, we never say how good you are. And then we even accuse you, O oh God, because you're not doing what we think you ought to do. Forgive us that we've even judged you, Father is not a good father because of what we see. And yet you call us to yourself and bring us to the table of faces and saying, you're more important than what you know. But don't be like the disciples who are looking for a place of significance. There's some of you today God wants to set free with the insecurity of feeling your own, you need to have more significance. When people are searching for their own significance, they'll try to be smarter than, than anybody else. They'll, they'll inject, they'll say things to, for attention. That's a sad way. He wants you to know that he loves you for what you do. Not for what you do, but who you are. He is a sound that's reminating inside of your spirits as you're a son, you're a daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. And the enemy can't take that from you because God created you with the eternity in your heart pinging heaven lift your head because your redemption is closer than when you first believed this is a day that God wants to set you free stand with me if you would please <clears throat> there's some people that I don't know who you are thank God but just the idea that you're ready for a transformation you can continually say all the while I was left behind, something happened, and blame. If you're in the blaming mode of something or somebody, then you're stuck. You're not believing God, you're stuck. 
And then they come back to the point and says, I'm going to trust God and not look to the left or right and wonder what anybody else is doing. If you're looking for a change, I heard recently, if you're looking for a job, maybe you're out of a job, then I want you to come and stand here. We're going to believe God. This is a family household of God. We're believing God for a change, for a change the job that you want, not the job you have to endure. <clears throat> Thank God for that. I mean, I like my job. <clears throat> I should clarify that a little bit. Or do I have a job? I don't know if I even have a job. <laughs> when you come, what you're saying is, I want to hear a sound, Acts chapter 2, as a sound of the rushing of the mighty wind. The sound was not to be the one to get their attention. The sound was what was getting ready to happen. And the reason that God had to speak back to them on the Mount of Transfiguration was because they got their eyes on wow here's Moses and here's Elijah that's pretty cool and God had to say hey this is my son I want you to hear him so maybe you've gotten it off just the ways of the world and it's just been really convicting and convoluted and, and even caring that nobody cares don't be like me and buy into that because you'll have plenty of people that will confirm that to you I mean they will, they will they'll hunt you down you attract all of those same spirits. But if you transform that to saying, I am worth every bit of thing. I don't have time to get into it, but develop your own affirmation. I am worth everything the blood of Jesus has purchased for me. Find, if you're standing out there, find someone and say, I am worth everything the blood of Jesus has paid for. I'm worth it. You're worth it. Not because what you've done or not done, because who he is. And don't let who, what you've done or not done do, you know, be contrary to what he is saying. So I want the ministry team just to come and stand with people here.